May the Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to Jerusalem Presbyterian Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Do we have any announcements before we begin today? Good morning. I just want to remind you people that um, the Hope Center breakfast is going to be next Thursday. We need some help, so if anybody wants to sign up, that would be great. We'd really appreciate it. This Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, we are having a Zoom to talk about the aforementioned chicken barbecue. So uh, I'm going to be sending out that Zoom link on probably Tuesday morning, so it's fresh in your inbox, ready for you to click on it at 6 o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, If you would like to be a part of that, let me know so I can make sure that you're on the email. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week. We will have our normal Palm Sunday service. The following Thursday, then, is Monday Thursday, so not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, our service, which is, to me, one of the greatest services of the year, will be at 7 o'clock on Monday Thursday. Uh, And the choir will be singing, and we'll be uh, doing our traditional candlelight tenebrae service. The following Sunday, of course, is Easter. So we are heading into the biggest time of the year. Uh, For those of you who are wondering who haven't heard, yes, I'm having surgery on my foot the day after Easter. So I will be uh, not at church the following two weeks after that with possibly a third or fourth week, depending on how the recovery goes. So there will be more information about that in the April newsletter. Those of you who can join me in... Here is the church, here is the steeple, open the doors and see all the people, okay? The problem is we are the church and we are the people of the church and it's up to us to see all the people out there and their needs and this is one way that the Presbyterian Church does that. The Presbyterian Church has four special offerings in a year. The first one is one great hour of sharing. The second is Pentecost. Third is global peace. And fourth is the um, Christmas joy offering. They each have a purpose and a, um, uh, a target group. One great hour of sharing is over 70 years old and supports three programs. When I was a kid, we used to get these little cardboard banks and take them home and fill them. And then, um, and my mother would worry about the four of us. That's a lot of kids, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of pennies. But the the three programs uh, of the One Great Hour Sharing are the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Fund, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and the. the Um, self-development of people. All work together and serve the people and the communities in their needs. Money collected through one great hour of sharing funds grants through these these three programs. Um, The disaster release, uh, the disaster relief assistance, which is the first one, can be either natural disasters like the horrendous um, tornado that hit Mississippi uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, Or they can be natural, uh, natural disasters like that, or they can be man-made disasters. For example, about 40 years ago, an earthen dam holding the United Nuclear Corporation mill tailings ruptured and 1,000 tons of solid radioactive mill waste and 90 million gallons of radioactive waste poured into the San Puerto River at Church, Church Rock, New Mexico. The contamination of the land, air, and groundwater immediately affected nine Navajo municipalities, Gallup, New Mexico, and communities as far away as Arizona and impacted their health to there this day with increased miscarriages, birth defects, and cancer. A grassroots organization grew up around this and with the help of the um, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance people. 
number two, <clears throat> that was number one. Number two, the Presbyterian Hunger Program last year gave out $1.2 million uh, in grants to um, 22 countries, including the United States. So that's also thank you for your donations. Um, <clears throat> the um, development of people. In Uganda, women are often cheated out of their inheritances and land, and the Presbyterian supported action for rural women's empowerment teaches women to stand up and claim their land, which enables them to continue to support their families. So one great hour it, um, is in, involved in many aspects of many people's lives. Uh, <clears throat> it will be gratefully collected on Palm Sunday and Easter, so that's next week and the week after that. We are the church. This is the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. If we all do a little, it'll add up to quite a lot. Thank you. Please join me in the call to worship. From where will our help come? Who is our keeper? The Lord is our keeper. Amen. How long will God protect us? God will protect us this time on and forevermore. Let us worship our helper, our keeper, and our protector. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful Creator, you call us to trust in you completely, but we do not. You try to justify our actions and words. Loving Redeemer, we struggle to understand the new life you offer. We choose inaction instead of stepping forward in faith. Glorious Sustainer, Forgive us, we pray. Help us to be born again into the life of Christ, trusting that you have included us by grace in the family of faith. We pray in Christ's merciful name. Amen. The mercy of God from everlasting to everlasting. God is the Alpha and the Omega. That's where we are confession. We are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also be with you. Please pass the peace to your neighbor. It begins now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? 
they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? What things? The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures.
As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and, they van and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been known to them, been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So earlier this week, an ad on Facebook caught my eye. It was from Meyer, and that's where I do most of my grocery shopping. And the Meyer ad read. During Ramadan, Muslims all over the world fast from sunrise to sunset for a month. The fast is broken at the end of each day with a meal called iftar, at which dates are traditionally served. Dates are packed with nutrients, making them the perfect energy source after a long day of fasting. Shop Meyer online and in store for delicious fresh dates and more for your iftar meal. So today we're talking about something that's important in every culture and every tradition. We're talking about food. Well, we're talking about meals. There was a woman of Scottish descent in my first church in Washington, Indiana, named Ruby. And every time the church would have a potluck, which in Indiana they call a pitch-in, every time we had a pitch-in, she would exclaim, Presbyterians are the best at cooking. And in my head, I always thought, I'm sure the ladies at the Baptist church and the Methodist church down the street might have something to say about that. All cultures have traditions around food, around fellowship, around the meals. It's, it's what makes us human. In Judaism, it's the Sabbath meal. In Islam, iftar. We have potlucks and other meals. But before we get too far into this, I'm looking for some brave souls to share with everybody. When you think of a traditional meal, a time of celebration that's specific, what tradition or culture do you think of in your family? Anybody have something jump to mind? Thanksgiving, what about Thanksgiving? The turkey and the, the fall harvest, we come in together and celebrate. Okay, so turkey and fall harvest. That was St. Patrick's Day. Okay, St. Patrick's Day, right? Corned beef and cabbage. Sue? Well, for my uh, Norwegian grandmother, we would have oysters, too, on Christmas Eve. Okay, oyster stew on Christmas Eve, Norwegian tradition. Phyllis? Homemade noodles for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Anybody else? What? Okay, I still can't. Stone. Oh, stone, yeah. Okay. Jean. Ham on Easter, right? So we all have these traditions, right? We all have of customs. We may not think of them often, but they're there, right? It's not Thanksgiving without turkey. It's not ham, I and mean, it's not Easter without ham, uh, is how a lot, of, a lot of families think. So we're gonna come back to the idea of the importance of meals in a bit. But throughout Lent, we're talking about communion. We're focusing on the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Two weeks ago, we looked at the, the many theological interpretations for the sacrament. And last week, we turned to, a different, to the different doctrines developed before, through, and after the Reformation, including the real presence of Christ. Today, we're gonna to look at some of the symbols that surround us, symbols that 
unless we pay attention to them, they're, they're just there. They inform how we see the sacrament, even without us knowing. If we look closely, we'll see that symbols flow through the whole experience. And we begin in the same place as where we were last week, 500 years ago, during the Reformation. And we've mentioned before that the roots of our tradition were born out of a response to medieval Roman Catholic Church. So to have an appreciation for the symbolism, we need to first understand what that world was like, what church and communion were like in the Middle Ages. So if you were living in Germany or France or the Netherlands or Belgium or anywhere in Europe, if you were living there before Martin Luther, odds are you did not understand much about the mass because it was in a language, Latin, that the normal people didn't speak. The Germans in Germany, or what is now Germany, spoke German. They didn't speak Latin. So they wouldn't have understood the mass, most of the people at least. And you most likely didn't own a Bible because books were expensive before the printing press. And it didn't matter that you didn't own a book because you probably didn't know how to read. So in most Catholic churches, the altar was set up against the wall in the chancel with a little cupboard where only the priests were able to go. And when the sacrament was given to the general public, right, they came up to the rail, and when they came up to take the host, they only took the host, they only took the bread. The cup was not given to the normal people. It was just for the priests. And so what we need to understand in all of this is that the whole practice was shrouded in mystery and was largely inaccessible to most people. So how did the reformers change that? And how does our symbolism reflect decisions made 500 years ago? First of all, you'll notice that the communion table is in the center of the room. That's not on accident. There is no separation physically or spiritually between the congregation and the table. As the celebrant, I stand on this side, or, well, today I'll sit on this side. Why? Because there's nothing in between you and the table. We are around the table together. The table is also accessible in the sense that even though I'm the celebrant, elders and others serve the sacrament every week, every time we have communion. There are no limits on who is involved. It used to be in the Presbyterian Church that you had to be an elder, and then they changed it to be an elder or a deacon, and now they, they put it in the power of the session, the elders, to decide who can serve the sacrament, and this church basically has an unwritten rule that anybody that the elder chooses can serve the sacrament. You don't need to be a communicant member. One of the, one of the kids has served the sacrament before. Uh, so there are no limits when we pass the bread and the cup. The final thing to talk about, you might have already caught this, but in the Presbyterian world, we don't use the word altar. This is a communion table, a table, not an altar. Now, the emphasis then is, not on the sacrifice of Christ, but on coming to Christ's table for a meal, to share a meal together. And some of you may know, and I'm trying not to make eye contact with anybody, I have a bad habit of correcting anybody who calls this an altar. The idea of communion as a meal, as a, as a time of revelation with Christ, as embracing the divine mystery. These thoughts are present, not just in our culture, but in our scripture, including the, the story that Karen and I just read of the two followers of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. The two travelers are met by a third person who we're told is the risen Jesus. This is, this is basically Easter afternoon. And the stranger teaches them about scripture, about life, about faith. But the story tells us it's not until they share a meal that they fully understand. Listen again. 
When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us? Wisdom, understanding, faith, community, truth, true relationships. These are the things that happen when we share a meal together. It's not a surprise that weddings usually have a meal afterwards. The memorial services and funerals usually have a meal afterwards. That's how people come together, is over food. It is the most human thing we can do together. So we've been on a journey at JPC the last few months. The journey began on January 8th when we had communion by intinction. This choice was made as a matter of convenience. I was chatting with Dave before the service. Dave was the elder in charge of putting together communion that day. And we didn't know, being in January 8th, how many folks would actually be in attendance. And it's easier to not get the trays out if you, if you don't know if you're going to have 20 people or 60 people. And we decided to, to have the preparation be in tension because it was also going to be a more casual service. And afterwards, Dave came on and up to me and he said, that was so beautiful. He was so moved by it. <clears throat> to be the one holding the bread and to see every person face to face when they come forward. It was something that he didn't often experience. And Dave, I, I hope you're okay with me sharing this story. I forgot to run a bio beforehand. But don't worry, someone else who's not here is about to be talked about. Because this sentiment also came up a month ago in our worship committee meeting when Christy Kilpatrick mentioned that she too found great meaning in the intimacy and connection and intinction. And she said, it's, it's when somebody looks me in the eye and says, Christ's body broken for you. as she received the bread. To which I replied, don't you say this to each other as you pass the trays? And the committee as a whole looked at me like I was from outer space. No, we, we didn't know that we're supposed to do that. So I'm going to tell you today, there, there are two phrases for each of the two actions that's appropriate to say when you pass the tray or when you offer an intention the body of Christ, or the bread of life. The blood of Christ, or the cup of salvation. Body of Christ, bread of life, blood of Christ, cup of salvation. This is how we welcome each other to the table. So today, when we pass the trays, I would like each of you, as you pass it, to turn to the person and say, the bread of life, or turn to them and say, the body of Christ, or turn to them and say, the blood of Christ, or turn to them and say, the cup of salvation. Because we share the meal with each other. Without the act of sharing, there is no meal. Without the act of sharing, there is no communion. It makes us most human in this moment. And and paradoxically, it's where we're closest to our creator and our God as well. Because we are closest to God when we are most human. That's how faith works. That's how life works. So this week, as I was preparing the sermon, I went and answered the questions for myself, the question that I asked you at the beginning. The question about important traditions and memories and meals. And as I tell these stories, if you want to listen, that's great. But if your mind drifts and shifts to your own traditions, your own families, your own memories, that's great too. Because each of these are personal to us. They're each specific to us. So I could bring up what, what y'all talked about. I could bring up the, the Holmes family Christmas Eve parties. 
or the oddity that growing up, my family always, always had Easter dinner on Good Friday night. But instead, I want to bring up two family-related meals and two church meals. So the first one is why we always had Easter dinner on Good Friday night, and the Easter Bunny always made a special trip to our house on Saturday morning, is because we were always at church on Sunday morning, and then we were off like a rocket after Easter service on our way to vacation for spring break. And the rule was we couldn't have the lunch in the car until we were out of our town. And we usually would stop, that, especially when I was in high school. When I was much younger, when I was in elementary school, my folks were all about the educational trips. So we went to Washington, D.C. one year, Philadelphia, New York one year, Boston one year. Then my sister eventually, when she was in high school, she's like, I want to go to the beach. I'm tired about learning about stuff. So we went to Hilton Head, and then, and then we finally settled at Myrtle Beach. And we probably went to Myrtle Beach five or six years in a row for spring break. And so we would stop for the night, because Detroit to Myrtle Beach is a pretty big hike. We would stop in Beckley, West Virginia. And in Beckley, West Virginia, we would have Easter dinner that night out of a cooler. We would have the cooler packed, and we would have the leftover ham, and we'd have the leftover deviled eggs, if there were any. And we always found a summer sausage and some cheese, and my mother forced us to have some fruit with it, too. But eating out of a cooler is a memory that I will always remember. The number of my times my sister, whose birthday is on April 7th, got shafted by having birthday dinner out of a cooler in Beckley, West Virginia. I will always remember those days. The, the other family story comes from near the family cottage outside of Krivitz. There was a restaurant on the Peshtigo River outside of Krivitz named Schaefer's. And Schaefer's was there for decades. And they served Ma Schaefer's fried chicken. And it was my first experience of a supper club where you would go and you would sit in the lounge and the family would play cards, hearts, and we would order and we would drink. And you would sit in the lounge and they would make you sit in the lounge drinking, right? It was a good business model until your food was ready. Then they would call you into the dining room and you'd have the best, thickest fried chicken you've ever had. The thing about Schaefer's is that my family was going there long before I was alive. My grandparents found it in the late 50s, early 60s. I don't even know when. And we're going there every year, every year, every year. And it was the one trip we went, when we went to the cottage, grandpa and grandma always took us to Schaefer's. And we would play hearts, and we'd have kitchen, and we'd have wonderful chicken. And I remember that they had a playground outside. And now this was a playground different than playgrounds today. Because this was like the mid 80s, late 80s. So safety really wasn't in the forefront of their mind when they built this thing. They had a swing set that also, for some reason, had a set of rings, you know, like gymnastic rings, that my brother, when he was a little kid, was on the rings, lost his grip, and literally fell on his head and broke his glasses. Memories that you remember, right? Times at Schaefer's, out playing by the Pekeshiko River, having wonderful chicken. Those are the two family stories I wanted to tell you. The two church stories. One goes back to the beginning of this sermon to Ruby Fry and the monthly pitch-ins at Westminster Church. We would have a potluck the first Sunday of every month in the evening. And there was one that I'm remembering specifically. It was, I think, about the April potluck, because April in Indiana could be warm enough to be like cooking outside. We're in Wisconsin, good luck with that the first week of April. But I remember that morning at church, Harry Hansen, I think I've told you about Harry before, the old small town lawyer, said, don't worry, I'm putting something good in the smoker for dinner tonight, for the potluck. And, and Harry brought with him a rack of ribs, smoked down the smoker. And I showed up and I had a dessert. Harry's wife was out of town. I think that's why Harry wanted to fire up the smoker. So Harry was there and I was there. And I can't even remember who the third person was, because this was, you know, 15 years ago at this point. And they brought a salad. 
And that was all the people that came to the potluck that night. The smallest potluck I've ever been to. Three people. And we had an entree, a salad, and a dessert. Even with three people, we had a perfect meal. Fifteen years on, I remember that night. The final story is a conglomeration of stories that have taken place at Zinn's twice, at Water Street Brewery twice, at Cornerstone, at Fork in the Road, at Thunder Bay, and at the Bartz's home. I'm talking about all the meals over the last couple months that we've had, the fellowship meals that so many people have participated in. I'm hoping that tradition can continue. I'm not going to speak for Pam and Marilyn or for Linda or for the Snyders, but I think we had a great time on Friday night at Water Street having fish or chicken. Austin was there, and it was so great to see Austin. And he and I chatted about wrestling. And I remember being at Zinn's for the homecoming crowd from Arrowhead in the most absurd dinner I've had in a long time. And at Zinn's a couple, like two weeks ago, when we sat in the bubble outside. And Cornerstone and Fork and Road and brunch at Thunder Bay. I have loved these events because we are most together when we share a meal together. If you haven't signed up for these, I hope you do in the future. It's been a real blessing in my life to get to know people one meal at a time, to get to know people better. And if you've never been forced to play bingo at the Bartz's house, where Larry said nobody leaves until everybody's a winner, <laughs> it was a wonderful night and one that I will, you know, it's a memory, right, that I will remember for a long time. So meals, when we share them, are what hold us together. That's why we come to the table. To God be the glory. Amen. Great Lord, we pray for all those who are battling cancer. We pray for those who are having surgery, for those who are undergoing treatments, radiation and chemotherapy. We pray for those who are still battling COVID and other ailments. We ask that you watch over those, not just who need medical attention, but also those who are lonely, those who need your compassion, those who need the compassion of others. We pray for all caregivers as well, watching over their loved ones. We pray this day prayers of joy, prayers of gratitude for this world, for the beauty of this world, for the promise of spring, for birthday celebrations, for anniversaries, for times of occasion, for times of sharing meals together. We pray for those who are in Mississippi affected by the tornadoes and just ask for you to be with those who've lost loved ones or who've, who've lost their lives. We pray for all those in the world who are hurting, for those in violent lands that they may find peace, and those in oppressive lands that they may find freedom. We pray for our leaders, those who make decisions that affect us all. We ask for you to, to guide them and give them wisdom and strength. And give wisdom and strength to leaders around the world that they may look for peaceable solutions. As we prepare to enter into Holy Week, we pray for you to guide us, to guide your church, to keep us faithful, to allow us to be your hands in this world to allow us to, to share of ourselves. We pray not just what I've spoken out loud and the prayers that others have mentioned, but we pray the prayers that are deepest within our hearts. For we know that you hear everything and walk with us every day. We pray all of this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother and Father of us all. Amen. And so we come to the table of our Lord. Because scripture tells us that at the end of days they shall come from north and south, from east and from west, and sit at table together. 
to share a meal together. So all are welcome here. All who take Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, all are welcome here. Will you join with me in the great prayer of thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Great Lord, it is indeed right to give our thanks and praise. Thanks and praise for the beauty of the earth. Thanks and praise for the beauty of song. Thanks and praise for beauty all around us. We're grateful for all of the gifts of creation. We're grateful for family and friends, for times of occasion. We're grateful for your presence in our lives. We ask that you watch over us as we sit at your table. We ask that you be present with us. We ask that you be also present with the great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Therefore, we join our voices with all that have come and all that will come, singing. Holy Lord, God of power. Wonderful God, we give gratitude for the presence of Jesus Christ, for the incarnation, for your divinity here in this world. We're grateful that, that Christ came down and healed and preached and taught, and that he gave up himself to save the world. We're grateful for his sacrifice on the cross and the empty tomb that followed. And so today we proclaim, great is the mystery of faith. Christ is risen. Great Lord, we ask that you pour out your spirit upon these simple gifts, gifts of bread, gifts of juice, that the bread we break may be your body that the cup that we bless may be your blood, that through these simple gifts they may become holy and acceptable to you. And we ask that through by partaking these things that we also become holy and acceptable to you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught disciples of all nations to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so we tell the story that on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took a common loaf of bread, and having given thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. Take this, eat this in remembrance of me. And after supper, our Lord took a common cup and said, this is the new covenant shed by my own blood for the forgiveness of sins. So this day, as we eat this bread and as we drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's dying and rising and living until he comes again in glory. Amen. Will the communion service please come forward? We eat together, for we are reminded that as the body of Christ, we so desperately need each other. Friends, Christ's body broken for us. Let us pray. Great Lord, I ask for you to seal this sacrament upon our hearts, that it may guide us, that it may bless us, that it may reinvigorate us as we come closer to your cross and to the empty tomb to follow. Keep us humble. Keep us faithful. Keep us just. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. It is the presence of Christ in our life, but also it is sharing life with those of us around us. So this week, as we are the children of God, let's live that out in every conversation we have, in every encounter we have. So friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and all those whom you love, and all those whom God calls you to love. From now until our Lord comes again in glory. Amen.